Welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Rethinking Africa this evening. My name is uh, Boniface Mabanza. I work as coordinator for the Ecumenical Service on Southern Africa, based in Heidelberg, in the south of Germany. And it's my pleasure to moderate our event tonight. Today's conference is the second of the series Rethinking Africa for this year. And now allow me to introduce you our speaker for this evening, Dr. Ndongo Sambasila. Dr. Ndongo Sambasila is uh, a Senegalese development economist. He is currently a research and program manager at the West Africa Office of the Rosa Luxemburg F Foundation, based in Dakar. His publications cover topics such as fair trade. He has written a very important book on fair trade with the title Marketing Poverty to Benefit to, to, benefit to Rich, the Fair Trade Scandal. He also covers topics like labor markets in developing countries, social movements, democratic theory, economic and monetary sovereignty. He will touch on that topic also today. He has co-authored many other books. I uh, want just to point out two for this evening. One about social movements in West Africa and uh, another one also very important in the context of today, since we are talking about uh, independence and sovereignty in Africa. It's a book with the title, Rediscovering Sankara, Rediscovering Thomas Sankara, Marcha of Freedom. Thank you again for joining us. And now I will hand over to Dr. Ndongo Sambasila for his inputs. And uh, after that, we'll uh, discuss the questions and comments you'll write in the, the chat. Before I give him the floor, maybe it's important to, to tell to you that uh, Dr. Ndongo Sambasila has been one of the coordinators of an open letter uh, signed by more than uh, 100 or 150 African intellectuals trying to reflect on the necessity for the African continent to take the current crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, as opportunity to rethink the continent. Thank you, Dr. Ndongasila, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Boniface Mabanza. And um, it is a great pleasure to be here among you. I'm very uh, privileged to be invited uh, to have uh, this uh, talk about uh, how we could uh, rethink uh, Africa. So I say also uh, thank you to all those who are attending uh, this uh, conference. Uh, so with your permission, I will uh, uh, share my uh, screen as I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so my presentation, as uh, Dr. Boniface Mabanda said, will be about um, the following topic six decades of nominal independence 1960 2020 time for african people to reclaim their economic and monetary sovereignty uh this is a um, provocative title uh but um i think we'll see that it's not so provocative because uh, reclaiming uh the economic and monetary sovereignty is something that is uh, necessary at this uh, 
uh, current uh, um, particular uh, period. Uh, so as the title suggests, uh, I am going to articulate uh, my presentation uh, with a viewpoint of a development economist. It's important to, to stress that uh, because there are many aspects of the trajectory of uh, post-independence Africa uh, that I will not uh, speak about due to time constraints. Uh, for example, there are many uh, issues allowing to map continu continu colonial continuities, like, for example, uh, military interventions, uh, the role of culture and education um, in the cementing colonial logic, uh, unfair trade and fiscal agreements, uh, the pre predatory practices of some multinational, etc. I will not uh, speak about that in my presentation, but maybe we could uh, um, speak about those aspects uh, during the, the Q&A. Uh, I have to say also that my point of view is a point of view of uh, someone who is who was born after the independences. So certainly uh, the point of view of uh, younger generations uh, is not necessarily the point of view of those who uh, uh, lived during colonial times. So here in my presentation, I will focus on a narrow topic uh, which is the African dominant and lasting colonial economic model. Uh, to what extent uh, did it evolve or not? Uh, why I choose this topic and why it seems to me important is that uh, what a country produces, uh, how it produces and how it allocates its economic surplus is a fundamental and decisive factor uh, influencing the material possibilities and the material well-being of uh, its uh, citizens. Uh, so that's my uh, the lens I will use to discuss about uh, post-independence Africa. Uh, my plan will be uh, articulated on about uh, four major points. The first part will be uh, what reference should we use uh, to take stock of African independences meaning basically what kind of methodology, what kind of baseline should we use to assess what has been done since the independences. The second part uh, will be about the lasting legacy of primary specialization. That means the economic model uh, inherited from colonialism. Part three would be an assessment of what have been done since uh, six decades. I will develop the argument that we have witnessed it uh, quantitative achievements much more than qualitative achievements. Uh, part four will develop the idea that the current and dominant orthodox economic policies are a way of perpetuating the colonial type economic framework. And uh, in the conclusion, I will uh, uh, speak about the necessity for economic and monetary sovereignty. Uh, so, uh, in my title, I talked about six decades of uh, independences of decolonization. In fact, I have to uh, precise that there have been different waves of decolonization in Africa. And not all countries have been colonized. Ethiopia, for example, has never been colonized. Also, it was temporarily occupied by Italy. Liberia was the first African country which became independent in 1847. Uh, followed by South Africa in 1910 and Egypt in 1920. Uh, in the 1950s, we had some countries who took their independence like Libya, Sudan, Tunisia, Morocco, Ghana, and Guinea. In 1960, uh, the date I choose, uh, mostly uh, the countries which took their independence were former French colonies, uh, 40 of them, among them, among them 12 who still use the, the, the CFA franc, the colonial currency. Uh, so in 1960, we had uh, 14 former French colonies, plus Nigeria, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Somalia, who took their independence. Uh, between 1961 and 1968, uh, it was mostly former English colonies, 11, who took their independence, plus Algeria, a former uh, territory dominated by the French, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, which were dominated by, by the Belgian, 
and Equatorial Guinea, which was a former Spanish colony. Uh, between 1973 and 1977, there were five former Portuguese colonies, Cabo Verde, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea, Bissau, Sao Tome, and Principe, uh, which took their independence, accompanied by uh, Comoros, Seychelles, Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, which is officially recognized by the uh, African Union as a sovereign territory, and Djibouti. And the last two countries which decolonized uh, were Zimbabwe in 1980 and Namibia in 1999. Uh, following that, there was uh, Eritrea and South Sudan, which became independent in 1991 and 2011. But uh, these were secessions rather than uh, episodes of uh, decolonization. So uh, what reference should be used uh, to take stock of African independences? It seems to me that there are three possible ways of taking stock of African independences. The first is to compare the colonial period, uh, for example, let's say 80, 80, 85, uh, coinciding with the Berlin Conference, which split the, the continent, and the 1960. Uh, the second reference could be uh, to compare post-independence Africa with the West and other regions of the Global South. Uh, there is a third uh, perspective, uh, which is my favorite one, uh, trying to assess post-independence Africa with regard to the potential of the African continent and to the expectations raised by the end of formal colonialism. And that means trying to assess uh, whether post-independence Africa was successful at putting an end and to overcoming the most pernicious aspects of colonial logic and imperialism. Uh, starting with the first aspect, uh, is it uh, would be would it be sound to compare the colonial period with the post-colonial one? Uh, I would say that this type of comparison would not be appropriate. The first reason is that the colonial system was not about developing African economies, nor emancipating African peoples. So any presumably achievement during the colonial period was fortuitous and not intrinsic to the objectives of the colonial system. The second reason is that any presumably achievement of the colonial system, uh, let's say, for example, progress in healthcare, uh, did not require violence, oppression, and exploitation, racism, because colonialism was all, all of that violence, oppression, exploitation, and racism. And uh, if there had been achievements, those achievements did not need uh, such kind of uh, practices. And as a matter of fact, and this is the third argument, the human rights uh, in brackets and human development records of uh, colonialism in Africa were abysmal. And so beside the two points above, the colonial system is a very uh, minimalist, very weak comparative standard. And uh, to see why uh, I give here the a quote from Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney is a scholar uh, who wrote this powerful book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And there is a very telling quote in this book. He was saying that the only positive development in colonialism was when it ended. And when Walter Rodney uh, spoke about colonialism in this uh, particular sentence, he was referring to uh, the formal uh, colonial administrations which left following the independences. So the only positive development in colonialism was when it ended. And I fully share this um, kind of point of view. And um, there is another quote from the Franco-Egyptian economist, Samir Amin, uh, who has also a very telling quote. He was saying in an interview uh, he uh, gave in two years ago that uh, I quote him in 1960 in the Belgian Congo, there were nine, not ten, black-skinned Congolese who had high education, six religious and three civilians. After 30 years of one of the most odious regimes in Africa and the world, that of Mobutu, today there are not nine, but three million edu high-educated people. So the worst regime has done thousands of, thousands of times better than the beautiful colonization. Uh, when he uh, used the sentence, beautiful colonization, he, he used that with uh, some, some humor because obviously Sami Amin was highly critical of what colonization 
was. So it would not be sound to try to compare what has been done uh, following the independences with colonization because uh, colonization did not bring uh, any major benefit to African peoples. So the second standard to, uh, to assess what has been done uh, following the independence period would be to try to compare the performances of Africa with those of Western countries or other countries of regions of the Global South. But uh, this type of comparison would not be appropriate either, to my point of view. The first, uh, the first reason is that uh, economic development in the West and underdevelopment in most of the Global South are two sides of the same coin. Uh, this type of comparison could have been relevant if the economic trajectories of countries were autonomous or unrelated, but that is not the case. Uh, wherever economic centers exist, economic peripheries must also exist by necessity. And actually, the relationships between centers and peripheries have been shaped by colonialism and imperialism during the last, let's say, three uh, centuries. And the idea that countries of the Global South could economically catch up uh, with the Western standards of living is itself part of the dominant imperialist narrative. Uh, because often when we try to compare what Africa has achieved, uh, the, the, the standard use is the Western lifestyle. And we know, uh, at least since uh, uh, the uh, late Brazilian economist uh, Celso Furtado, that uh, this belief in what he called the uh, the myth of economic development is unwarranted. Uh, the myth of economic development is the erroneous belief that uh, under capitalism, uh, the average citizens of the global south, let's say a country like Niger, will one day enjoy the same lifestyle as the uh, average citizen in the European Union. Uh, this is simply uh, impossible. The average uh, citizens in the poorest countries of the world will never catch up with the living standards of the most developed countries because these are due to ecological constraints and there is a very good uh, paper which has been recently published online uh, which uh, covers uh, this this topic it's called the uh, global patterns of ecologically unequal exchange implications for sustainability in the 21st century so this uh, paper uh, try to uh, uh, try to study the flows between the global south and the global north and trying to see yeah where, where the flows net flows are going flows of biophysical resources and monetary flows too and there are three main results of this uh, really important paper uh, the first is that developing countries lose both on flows of bio biophysical resources and on, on monetary flows i caught them high income nations accomplish a net appropriation of materials energy land and labor while simultaneously gener generating a monetary surplus from those net appropriations. Uh, the second result of this paper is that economic growth in rich countries depend on unequal ecological exchange. Uh, I quote them again. The economic growth of welfare regions is achieved through high mass throughput and concurrent environmental burden shifting to poorer regions. The richest countries in the world tend to be net appropriators of materials, energy, land, and labor. Being able to generate the world's highest value added and income allows rich nations to appropriate resources in subsequent years, perpetuating unequal exchange relations. Uh, the third result is that economic catch up for the Global South is impossible, and this is a result uh, known to development economies of the Global South since at least five decades. And they say, I got them. Uh, because the economic growth model of industrialization requires the appropriation of resources from poorer regions, it seems illusory for all poorer nations to be able to catch up by, among other things, accessing even poorer regions from which to appropriate resources. Industrialization, as experienced by the world's wealthiest countries and some emerging economies like China, cannot become universal. So that means that, uh, uh, in short, the Western economic development model uh, could not be followed by the rest of the world. The same observation is valid for emerging countries like China. Any attempt to generalize to the whole world the Western China development patterns must lead to civilization collapse. So when we try to compare post-independence Africa's trajectory with the Western model, 
even when successfully emulated by some limited number of Asian countries, uh, we have to acknowledge that this is a meaningless exercise owing to the existence of ecological limits to the generalization of Western lifestyles. Uh, the third uh, point of view, uh, the third way of assessing uh, post independence Africa's trajectory is uh, consists in trying to uh, uh, see to what extent the continent has been able to overcome colonial legacies and imperialism. Uh, and that is my uh, the perspective I will use in this uh, presentation. Uh, the question uh, for me we should ask is the uh, following. Uh, did the independences and also the end of apartheid in South Africa in the 1980s uh, lead to the achievement of significant degrees of political self-determination in the continent and to the gradual liberation of Africans from the obstacles to a dignified life in equalitarian societies? Uh, the own, um, my own assessment answer I give in this presentation is that post-independence Africa has not been very successful in its efforts to overcome colonial legacies and imperialism. Uh, there have been major achievements for sure, but these have been quantitative rather than qualitative, as most parts of the continent have not broken up with the colonial economic model. So now I will go to my uh, second point uh, about uh, the lasting legacy of primary specialization. Uh, because one of the most uh, enduring legacy of colonialism in Africa is its primary specialization. Uh, when we uh, speak about primary specialization, we are meaning um, the fact of uh, producing and exporting primary products like oil, gas, mining products, and agricultural raw materials in exchange for uh, import products like manufacturing products and other high value added products. That has been the economic model during colonial times and it is still the main economic model for the majority of African countries. Uh, in this uh, slide, uh, you see uh, a graph uh, derived from a report by the United Nations uh, uh, United Nations Commission for Trade and Development, and um, uh, they uh, published uh, uh, regularly uh, uh, a publication named A State of Commodity Dependence. And for the edition of last year, uh, they show that uh, nearly nine countries in, Afri in Sub-Saharan Africa out of ten uh, remain commodity dependent. And you see in this graph that uh, Africa is the most commodity dependent uh, region uh, throughout the world. And when we speak about commodity dependency, we are speaking uh, of countries uh, uh, who derived at least 60% uh, of their uh, export receipt uh, from uh, exporting uh, commodity materials. So uh, Africa is the most commodity dependent region. And this has some implications. Uh, the first implication is that countries which are commodity dependent uh, have very low levels of economic and structural transformation. Uh, their economic growth is very volatile and depend on having good terms of trade, meaning having prices of exports rising higher than the prices of uh, imports. Uh, even when their rate of economic growth is high uh, in such kind of countries, uh, jobs are not created in net terms in the formal modern sector uh, as informal employment remains the norm. Uh, this kind of economic growth also uh, is associated uh, ordinarily with high level of social inequalities. Uh, it is also associated with uh, financial dependency and financial volatility. Uh, countries which are commodity dependent are also dependent on external financial flows like uh, debt in foreign currency, foreign, foreign direct investment, official development assistance, and migrant remittances. And at the same time, uh, these kind of, um, of external financial flows are coexisting with huge outflows, uh, like, for example, debt service payments, 
uh, profits and dividend repatriations and illicit financial flows. So in such an economic context, which is the dominant one in most African countries, the rate of economic growth is not a good indicator of economic transformation, rising labor productivity, decent job creation, high living standards for the majority. Uh, in fact, for most African countries, economic growth seldom equates with shared prosperity. That's why I will not give you uh, uh, statistics about the evolution of economic growth. I, I prefer to use as a kind of uh, uh, economic indicators. And um, the case of uh, Guinea, Equatorial Guinea, uh, could uh, uh, provide an illustration of the pattern of commodity dependence and also extractivism. Uh, Equatorial Guinea is an oil exporting country uh, with a population of around 1.3 million. Uh, in 1980, Equatorial Guinea had a per capita GDP, GDP is gross domestic product, of around uh, 600 US dollars, uh, measured uh, as economists say in purchasing power parities, PPP. Uh, but uh, by 2008, Equatorial Guinea has almost uh, multiplied its per capita GDP by a factor of 60. Uh, by 2008, its GDP per capita measured in the US dollar PPP was around 38,000. That was higher than the per capita GDP of Spain, uh, which is its former colonizer. But Ten years after that, in 2018, uh, its per capita GDP had halved uh, 19,000 US dollar. So uh, this country, which is the richest one until recently, was ranked among the least developed countries. It graduated only from this category in 2017 due to its high income per capita but not owing to its socioeconomic indicators, which are rather low because they are not commensurate with its income level. So with this case of Equatorial Guinea, you could see uh, why uh, strong economic growth, uh, exceptional economic growth, does not necessarily uh, translate into, let's say, uh, material well-being uh, for the majority. And one of the reasons for that is that this kind of economic growth has been associated with high level of extractivism. Uh, in this graph, uh, you see the evolution of what is called net income payments to abroad. Net income payments is uh, uh, the difference between income which have been transferred abroad uh, minus uh, income received. And by income, we mean, uh, for example, uh, interest payment on debt, uh, on external debt, uh, profit repatriations, uh, dividend repatriations, and uh, also uh, the uh, wage compensations uh, given to short-term, foreign short-term experts. When you make the difference between income transferred abroad and income received, you see that uh, in some years, the, the best years where the uh, Guinea, Equatorial Guinea had its highest rate of economic growth, you could see that um, 60% of GDP, for example, between 2004 and 2005, 60% of Equatorial Guinea's GDP uh, was transferred abroad uh, under net income payments. And you see that um, for, most, uh, for the most part of the last uh, three decades, at every year, at least 20% uh, of its GDP is transferred abroad uh yeah under under the form of net income payments so this is a striking uh example of uh, extractivism uh in africa i'm not saying that uh, this is representative of all africa it's not representative of all africa but it gives a uh, um, perspective on the kind of economic growth uh we see uh majoritarily in um, most african countries and here in this graph uh derived from the a work uh, we did with some colleagues, uh, Ingrid Kevin Craven, York University, and Kai Kodenbrock of uh, Frankfurt University. Uh, you see in this graph uh, the evolution of the FDI income, FDI if foreign debt investment, and interest payments on external debt. Uh, FDI income 
uh, is here in um, pink and uh, in red is interest payment on debt. And um, the sample covered in this graph uh, is uh, constituted of uh, 28 sub-Saharan Africa countries, including Nigeria and South Africa, and which represents 85% uh, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, gross domestic product GDP. And you see that uh, during the Africa rising period, that means the best period in terms of economic growth, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa transferred abroad under the form of uh, profit remittances 500 billion US dollar between 2000 and 2016. 500 billion US dollar. In the same period, 100 billion US dollar uh, were transferred abroad uh, to service interest on external debt. So if you accumulate the two flows, you have 600 billion US dollars which were transferred abroad during this period of high economic growth, but high economic growth uh, uh, driven by uh, a supper uh, commodity uh, cycle. Uh, this graph also is somehow uh, um, a good summary of what happened during the last six decades for Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole. Uh, you see that there have been two uh, decades of uh, strong economic growth. Uh, the first decade following independences and the Africa rising decade, 2000-2010. In 1960, uh, going to 1970, we have 4.6% economic rate of annual rate of economic growth for the whole region but this rate of economic growth declined to 3.7 percent and at the same time you see that the debt increase because in red you have the external public debt stock uh, as a share of gdp it went from 10 percent to 15 percent and after that uh, it climbed a lot in the 1980s and the uh, 1980s and 2000 decade why? Because this period has been the period of um, sectoral adjustment plan. Uh, African countries uh, were indebted and uh, they could not repay their debt because they did not have access to good prices for their raw materials. So the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank came saying that you have to pay the debt and you pay the debt through austerity. That means cutting um, uh, public spending on health care, on education, agricultural subsidies, um, collapsing the industrial sector, privatizing uh, public enterprises, and so on. And uh, when you implement austerity policies, it will never work because if you do not create uh, economic activity, uh, the debt ratio will never fall down. And that what happened during these two decades, 1918 and 2000. And uh, in 2000, uh, the debt GDP ratio declined a lot why? Because there were cancellations uh, of multilateral debt, partial cancellations. And at the same time, there were good commodity prices for Africa. And that's why we had this period of Africa rising, which was a period of catching up with past economic performances, and which was also driven by high prices for commodity products. But the uh, last decade, 2010, and now, uh, you see that this rate of economic growth declined. And at the same time, the debt GDP ratio uh, started again to to increase uh, because uh, with the economic growth of the Africa rising period, uh, foreign uh, investors were somehow attracted to um, to, uh, to to Africa, and most African countries got into debt in foreign currency. And now with the can can pandemic it seems like we are returning to the period of the 1980s with uh, African can, can countries being indebted and at the same time facing really low prices for their commodities and being in a position uh, of not being able to service their debt. So now the issue will be, uh, will we lose again one decade or two decades because African countries, African countries will have to pay the debt and the IMF and the World Bank will be uh, there to make sure that uh, through uh, harsh austerity policies, African countries will, will, will pay their debt. So this graph is a really good summary of uh, what happened uh, on average for um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So now I'll go to the 
to the part uh, three uh, with this kind of economic framework, uh, what had been achieved. So I will say uh, quickly that uh, uh, economic uh, uh, specialization on uh, primary commodities uh, is not, uh, let's say, a recipe for uh, helping uh, achieve uh, material progress for the majority. Uh, because this colonial type of economic model has not been altered overall, uh, there has been uh, limited uh, socioeconomic progresses for the majority. Uh, when I say that, I don't want to say that there have been no, no achievement. There have been many achievements. Uh, there have been important achievements during the last six, six decades. But I would uh, summarize those achievements by saying that uh, they have been much more quantitative than uh, qualitative. Uh, for example, in the following um, graphs, you will see that um, people live longer, but often they uh, uh, stay poor the majority of their life. Uh, most schools have been built, but they are in very bad shape. Uh, more jobs also are being created, but, are, but they are mostly informal and they do not help to escape uh, poverty. For example, in this first graph, you will see that uh, uh, many African countries have uh, done a tremendous progress in uh, increasing the life expectancy at birth. Uh, you see, for example, uh, the median uh, value, the median value is the value which divides the uh, African, let's say, uh, sample in two. Uh, and uh, you see that, for example, uh, following the independences, the um, average life expectancy at birth was 35 years. Uh, and now uh, you will see that uh, it's uh, less than 55, you see. Uh, in countries like uh, Niger, which is one of the most poor in the world, you see that Niger has a life expectancy at birth which is the median value for Africa, uh, more or less uh, 53, 55. Uh, and uh, despite that, this country has not uh, recorded any, uh, let's say, uh, economic growth, uh, if we look at economic growth on the long term. Uh, the country in Africa, which has the highest uh, life expectancy at birth, is Algeria. And um, you could see it in the graph. It's the yellow uh, uh, yellow line, and it has a life expectancy at birth of seven six uh, years. And uh, most of this progress regarding life expectancy uh, have been achieved by uh, diminishing uh, significantly uh, um, uh, the deaths of uh, the very young uh, people. Uh, let's say uh, people having less than five years. Uh, there have been also some achievements regarding access to electricity, but there is still a um, uh, wide disparity between African countries. Uh, you could see that there is only uh, five African countries uh, which have achieved universal access to uh, electricity in 2018. Uh, Tunisia, Seychelles, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt. And you see that uh, uh, for 25 African countries, uh, only um, less than 50% 50, 50 of the population have access to electricity. In countries like Rwanda, only a third of the populations uh, have access to electricity. And it's even worse in some countries like Niger or Burundi, where only 11% uh, only of the population have access to, to electricity. And uh, when you look at the schooling statistics, you have also a telling uh, picture. Uh, you see that many uh, schools have been built, many primary schools, uh, but you will see, for example, in countries like Central African Republic or uh, Democratic Republic of Cong Congo, uh, mostly all primary schools uh, do not have access to, to electricity. Uh, countries like Algeria or South Africa uh, have the better performances on this uh, indicator but for most African countries, um, they have, the majority of schools uh, do not have access to, uh, to electricity. 
and uh, that is the same thing for access to, to toilets. One uh, primary school out of three do not have uh, toilets, and uh, we see the same patterns with countries like um, uh, like Guinea Bissau, for example. Eighty percent uh, uh, of primary schools don't have uh, toilets, and Sudan you see fifty percent. You have much more, uh, let's say, uh, good performances on this indi indicator in uh, in North Africa and Southern Africa, but in Central Africa the situation is very uh, alarming. Uh, same thing also when we look at the access to drinking water in the primary schools, uh, half of primary schools don't have access to, to drinking water. And uh, this apply mostly also to uh, African countries in Central Africa like Niger, Chad, uh, DRC, uh, etc. All these statistics about uh, schoolings are derived from, from, from the UNESCO. And this is my point that there have been quantitative achievements, but uh, uh, there have not been uh, qualitative. There have not been a uh, change in uh, in orientation, uh, in well-being. Uh, uh, to add to this picture, uh, you have here a labor market indicators. Uh, you see that uh, most African uh, people in the labor force are employed. Uh, there is a very low level of un unemployment, which is generally normal for developing countries, as most of them could not afford not to be in employment. Uh, for example, this year, according to estimates by the International Labour Organization, uh, you see that um, uh, 400 million Africans were on employment. But you see that uh, most of them uh, were not in wage and salary employment. Only 23% uh, were on wage employment. And most of them also uh, are working uh, in jobs which uh, do not allow them to escape from poverty. In 2020, uh, according to ILO estimates, 60% of the African labor force uh, is in extreme and moderate working poverty. The good news is that somehow this has decreased uh, since the last, last uh, 15 uh, years. So these indicators uh, show that yeah, there have been quantitative increases, but qualitatively, yeah, there are um, a lot of progress to be uh, to be made. So I'm going to my last part, uh, part four. Um, in part four, I will try to develop uh, two 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 main arguments. Uh, the first argument is that the current and dominant economic policies uh, in Africa contribute to maintain uh, the continent in a colonial type of economic framework, the, the, the framework I just described. And the uh, second argument will be that the concept of neocolonialism, which has been uh, used to describe uh, the trajectory of uh, post-colonial or post-independence Africa, is outdated. Uh, I will try to defend the view that uh, uh, at least since the last two decades, uh, what we are witnessing is in Africa is more vicious than neocolonialism. And I call the, that development uh, globalism, and I explain what is globalism. Um, uh, mainstream economics generally tend to expand Africa's uh, disappointing economic performances by focusing on aspects such as the so-called marginalization of the continent in world trade, saying that Africa is too protectionist, and also pointing to the energy crisis of national regulatory framework, which would not be attractive to foreign investors. So for mainstream economics to overcome its challenges, the continent must liberalize and privatize further its external trade, finance, and investment. That's what mainstream economics generally says. That's uh, the type of uh, policies uh, advocated by the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization, and etc. But uh, we'll see that uh, these liberalization policies are not only based on a selective reading of empirical evidence, they, are also, they tend also to exacerbate the content's problems rather than solve them. Uh, for example, in this graph, uh, uh, it's really interesting because uh, in the 1980s, people were saying that Africa was marginalized by, 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 by the globalization, that Africa has a weak share of, uh, of world trade. In the 1980s, it was 1.5%. And in 
and you will see many articles, academic articles, many books saying that Africa is marginalized uh, by globalization because its share is low. But uh, this point of view uh, could be challenged uh, because uh, what is important is not uh, 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 firstly the share of Africa in world trade, but its share in, uh, in world GDP. And you see that um, uh, in the blue line here in the graph, uh, you have the uh, Africa's share in world GDP. Uh, the orange line is the Africa's share on world trade. And you see that Africa's share on uh, uh, world trade has always been superior until recently to Africa's share uh, in world GDP. That means that Africa is trading much more than justified by its share in the global economy, uh, in the uh, global economy output. And uh, for most countries, you would see a graph like that. That means that the uh, uh, share in world trade is somehow proportional to the share in, um, in global output. So uh, what you could say is that uh, Africa's share in the world, uh, world output uh, was, is low, uh, but we could not say that Africa has been marginalized because Africa has maintained its economic specialization and you would see no trend regarding this economic specialization around the uh, exports of uh, raw materials. So saying that Africa is marginalized, so Africa has to uh, put in place, uh, uh, let's say, liberalization policies will just be uh, a way of uh, maintaining this uh, pattern rather than trying to, to, to change it. Uh, Often also the discourse is that Africa is not really attractive and Africa has to be more open to foreign investors. In this graph, um, you will see that Africa is much more open to foreign investor than is uh, usually assumed. You will see that uh, in this graph, uh, uh, the foreign direct investment stock, when we talk about foreign direct investment stock, is the net uh, cumulated net flows of foreign debt investment. That means, for example, the net cumulated flows of foreign debt investment since at least the last five decades. And you see, for example, in Africa, the foreign debt investment stock represented 37.7% uh, of its GDP in 2019. That means last year. And you would see that Africa, on average, has a higher share of foreign debt investment compared to emerging markets in Asia, compared to Germany, uh, compared to China, and compared also to China, to, to Japan, where it is only 44.4% of, uh, of GDP. Only the United States of America had a uh, foreign direct investment stock uh, uh, as a share of GDP higher than the, the one for, for Africa. But you will see in the following graph that uh, this, um, this uh, statistic for Africa is an average an average which can uh, mask very wide uh, differences across countries. Uh, in this graph, you will see, for example, that there are at least 20 African countries which have a, a sh uh, foreign debt investment stock uh, as a share of GDP uh, higher than 50%. For example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you would see that uh, that uh, the foreign debt investment stock as a share of GDP is 50%. At the other extreme, you will see that in Liberia, the share of foreign debt investment stock is uh, 335% of GDP. That means the interest, the assets, real assets controlled by foreign debt investor are three times the value of gross domestic product. Yet, you would see uh, every time saying that Af Africa is not attractive, Africa is not uh, open to foreign investor. Whereas, you see that in developed countries, the share of foreign debt investment are much more reasonable than what you would witness, what you would observe in uh, most African countries. And this is the same thing for the, for the banking sector. Uh, you see, for example, uh, that uh, in Senegal, uh, the foreign bank assets uh, represent 94% of all total bank assets. That means the banking sector is major, majoritarily uh, dominated by, by, by foreign banks. And this is somehow the case in Ghana, but less extreme than in Senegal. And you will see that in countries uh, considered to be highly open to, to, um, 
to globalization countries uh, considered to be very attractive, like the United Kingdom and Germany, it is only uh, 14% and 13%. Whereas generally you would say that Senegal and Ghana are not attractive, are not really financially open. If you look at the share of foreign banks among total banks, it's the same pattern. You would see that in Senegal, 83% of uh, all banks are foreign. For Ghana, it's 63% of all banks are foreign. In United Kingdom, it's 58%. And in Germany, you just have 14% of banks which are foreign. And um, when you look at another indicator, which is really interesting, the share of domestic credit to private sector in GDP, uh, you will see that uh, countries dominated by foreign banks uh, do not generally fund the real economy. They do not generally finance the private domestic sector. In Senegal, it's 29%. In Ghana, it's just uh, 14 percent. Uh, you go to the United Kingdom, it's still 67 percent, and Germany, which is uh, which has a, a banking sector dominated by national banks, 84 percent of domestic credit. Uh, the, the domestic credit given to the private sector represents 84 percent of, um, of of GDP, and uh, dominance of the banking sector by foreign banks is a legacy also of colonialism. African uh, countries have tried to uh, nationalize their banking sector. They tried to do that the two decades after independence, but following the structural adjustment plan, they started to open up and also to liberalize first their foreign banking sector. And you see that uh, whenever the banking sector is dominated by uh, foreign banks, the private sector is rationed in terms of access to, to credit. Uh, so these uh, elements are, are showing the strong acceleration of African economies and their dominance by foreign capital are reminiscent of the concept of neocolonialism introduced by Kwame Kuma in 1965. Uh, in his book, you could see it on the picture, uh, Kuma wrote, all the fashion colonialism is by no means entirely abolished. It still constitutes an African problem, but it is everywhere on the retreat. In place of colonialism as the main instrument of imperialism, we have today neocolonialism. The essence of neocolonialism is that the state which is subject to it is in theory independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. This is the Koma's definition of, um, of, of, um, of neocolonialism. Uh, Neocolonialism, uh, when Koma used it, referred initially to the post-independence situation where the colonial administrations left while the former metropolises continued to maintain a lasting grip on the economy and polity of their former colonies. Um, domination maintained by the dominance of the banking sector by metropolitan banks, currency arrangements like the CFA franc, uh, bilateral trade preferences, military interventions, etc. But for me, the concept of neocolonialism is outdated. Uh, since the 2000s, with the advent of a more multipolar world, Africa is living under globalism, which I interpret as a multilateral economic colonialism. Uh, why I say that? Uh, because if we observe the, the evolution of the trade financial relationships uh, between former colonies and their former metropolises, we see that uh, these relationships have been contested and diluted by the re-emergence of countries such as China, India, and also by the alliances built by African ruling classes with diverse strata of foreign capital worldwide. And um, globalism, uh, for me, is about the continuation of economic colonialism, but without a visible colonizer. It consists in a polycentric logic of extractivism. Benef the benefits of extractivism happen in a more competitive context and are therefore reaped by a var variety of countries and actors. They are not only limited to former metropolises. And Afro-liberalism is the African avatar of globalism. Afro-liberalism has superseded Pan-Africanism, which is an ideal of African unity emancipation. Uh, Pan-Africanism has been superseded by Afro-liberalism among African ruling classes and Pan-Africanist institutions. And uh, projects such as the African Regional Currency Unions, modeled along the Eurozone 
and the African Continental Free Trade Area, the AFCFTA, for me are examples of the African Afro-liberal globalist projects, which are, for me, instruments of domination and exploitation of African peoples. In conclusion, uh, I would say that uh, the time is uh, ripe and the time is also um, uh, favorable for African countries to uh, reclaim their economic and monetary sovereignty. Because we know that uh, it's only during uh, crisis that uh, major and lasting achievements uh, could be, let's say, contemplated, could be uh, put in place. And uh, in that context, uh, there were two, two, two letters, actually. Uh, first letter in April saying that uh, Africa should uh, seize the COVID-19 as an opportunity to change uh, its uh, trajectory since the independences. And there was a second, uh, this first letter was signed by one, um, 100 and initially by 100 uh, African intellectuals from the continent, the diaspora, and after there we have collected uh, 200, 200 signatures. Uh, there was a second letter uh, published in um, September. Uh, this uh, open letter was uh, uh, signed by 700 academics, activists, organizers worldwide. And um, the message was that uh, uh, the, the pandemic uh, response calls for reclaiming economic and monetary sovereignty. And what uh, does it mean to reclaim economic and monetary sovereignty? It is first to uh, uh, forget the pursuit of blind growth, the, the strategy of economic catch-up, because we know that economic catch-up is something impossible. Uh, uh, and sadly, the strategies advocated by uh, current African governments, the IMF, World Bank, uh, and even their bi bilateral partners, consists on five main strategies, export-oriented growth, liberalization of foreign direct investment, of promotion of tourism, privatization of public enterprises, and liberalization of financial markets. All those strategies are dead end for us. And uh, as an alternative, what we propose is delinking. And by delinking, we do not mean autarky. We mean that uh, uh, constructing a world where the, uh, the needs, the objective needs, of ordinary peoples will be uh, priority compared to the demands of the world system. And to achieve that goals, we need to reclaim economic and monetary sovereignty. Uh, the goals uh, should be for us to decommodify the basic goods and services which are necessary to a dignified life. Uh, we have to achieve a food and energy sovereignty uh, and having also policies uh, which are inserted in the framework of uh, ecologically sustainable transformation and also social protection for all. And the means to achieve that uh, is to rely first and foremost on domestic resources and financing because African countries have enough uh, real resources to uh, achieve uh, uh, economic trans transformation which would be beneficial to the majority of their populations. Uh, a job guarantee should be devised for countries African countries and also uh, simulating domestic innovation systems and promoting participatory democracy. Uh, we should also fight to have um, a new uh, global economic system, a new global partnership where the global north and the global south uh, will cooperate uh, on technology transfers, uh, uh, also in uh, research and development, and also on sovereign insolvency structures. Uh, because uh, uh, currently with the pandemic, uh, many countries in Africa, in the global south, are in a position where they could not pay the debt. And paying the debt means, means that uh, uh, making their population uh, suffer uh, decades just to, to, to pay the debt. So we need uh, this kind of uh, framework in order to uh, make sure that the following decades will not be lost will not be decades of sufferings for, for African people. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ndongo, for this uh, very powerful and uh, fact input.
and uh, I think you have touched on very uh, important uh, topics and uh, we have uh, one hour to go for our discussion although my internet is uh, uh, giving us a bit of trouble the, the video is off now but I hope you can still uh, hear me so um, I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, comments and questions and uh, Julia is uh, compiling them. Before we go there, I would like to start myself. I have um, listened to you very carefully and I have some, uh, some questions. The first one would be when I listen to you uh, analyzing the first model of uh, assessing the relations between Africa and uh, Europe. Um, I couldn't hinder myself thinking about uh, Günther Nocke. I don't know whether you know the, the name. Uh, Günther Nocke is the Africa representative of the, German, of the German government and the German chancellor. And two years ago, if I don't mistake, he was uh, speaking about the legacy of, the, of colonialism. Um, and he said that uh, it's not fair only to put the finger on the negative aspects of uh, colonialism, because uh, colonialism also has some positive aspects has brought education, healthcare system, infrastructure to, um, to to Africa, and I would like you to react on uh, on on that, um, taking into account your your own analysis and uh, your position to this model. Uh, what do you say uh, when you hear uh, something like that? And maybe to just to complete what he was saying. Um, he was of the view that uh, the Cold War has damaged Africa more than colonialism. What would you say about that? Should I uh, answer now or wait? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know the um, um, German representative you are uh, alluding to. But um, I, um, go, I would go against his logic because uh, for me, you could not try to find uh, achievements during the colonial period. First reason, colonialism was not about emancipation. We know the famous um, saying of uh, M.S. Césaire in French, colonization égale chosification. That means colonization is objectification. Africans has been reduced to objects, objects subjected to um, uh, exploitation, oppression, racism, etc. So for me, you could not make a comparison uh, with a project which doesn't have an emancipatory uh, goal. The first thing is that, the second thing is that, let's suppose that there are good things which could have been brought by colonialism. We could ask the question, do we need violence for that? I have internet connection and I'm connecting with many people around the world to speak about important topics. Did we need to have uh, violence to have access to internet or any other things which uh, is uh, valuable for being in, in society? I don't think so. So any uh, presumably achievement of colonialism uh, could not be justified because we could not use violence to justify any kind of uh, achievements. And also, uh, with examples I have given with uh, Walter Rodney and Sami Amin, you see that the most brutal regimes in Africa, like Mobutu Sese Seko, which was, uh, who was, which, uh, who was a friend of, let's say, the, the US. Uh, George Bush used to say that this is the most uh, friend, uh, most uh, loyal friend of, uh, of the U.S. in Africa. That was the, um, the judgment of uh, uh, George Bush Senior about uh, Mobutu. And so you see those vicious regimes. 
they have done somehow better than colonialism. But I would never make the comparison because for me, uh, we could not uh, compare uh, colonialism, which was for me, a, which is for me a crime against humanity and other things. You can't. You can't. And the assumption that the Cold War was much more damaging for Africa, I don't think so. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, the two decades after independence uh, were decades where Africa tried to change the course of things. The Cold War has, uh, let's say, created a lot of troubles because there have been many, uh, let's say, uh, proxy wars, uh, proxy uh, battles in uh, Africa. But nonetheless, many achievements have been recorded during the two decades after independence. So I don't uh, share the view that the Cold War was more destructive, more destructive than, than, than colonialism. Thank you. Thank you very much. My uh, second question would touch on the resistances on the continent. You spoke about the fact that uh, we or the continent has focused on uh, quantitative uh, measures, achievements, mm -hmm. and uh, the continent were not able to change the, the trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, to change the orientation. But we also recall that uh, the African uh, um, uh, continent has had moments of resistance. Uh, we remember Thomas Sankara, you have edited a book about him, we remember uh, Patrice Emery Lumumba and, uh, and some others. My question would be, where did it go wrong? Why uh, couldn't the continent achieve to uh, sustain the resistance and to, to put in place the alternative uh, models some of the leaders wanted? Yeah. In fact, uh, in Africa, we had, for many countries, nominal independences. And the uh, best case illustrating that is the decolonization, so-called decolonization of former French colonies. They achieved their um, independence in 1960 for most of them. But you see that those countries have never been decolonized. Why? Because, uh, contrary to some countries like Algeria or some uh, Portuguese uh, former colonies, they wage, uh, let's say, a national war of liberation to get their independence. But in the case of the former French colonies, there was a deal between the French government and uh, those uh, who at the time uh, were leading uh, the territories under French domination. And most of those uh, leaders were trained in France. And what did the uh, French government tell them? I know that uh, independence is an uh, irreversible process. So you'll have your independence. But I'll give you your independence only if you sign agreements uh, amounting to say that you will have formal independence, but no sovereignty. Those have been called cooperation agreements in uh, domains like uh, raw materials. For example, the day Gabon signed, uh, the leader of Gabon signed uh, its uh, independence, pro proclaimed its independence, they signed an agreement we find saying that uh, the raw materials of Gabon uh, could not be sold uh, like Gabon wishes. Uh, if it has to be sold, France could put its veto. Gabon has not the right to issue its own currency. Gabon should use the, uh, the CFA franc. And all the um, uh, conversions of CFA francs into other currency have to be monitored by the French government. And you have many kind of agreements like that. So in the case of the um, of, uh, former French colonies, until now there is no decolonization. They are still under, uh, let's say, uh, French domination through currency and through also military interventions. And this somehow explains why uh, uh, at the independence, there was not a shift in terms of uh, economic orientation, etc. And we have also to say that there have been a lot of murders of progressive peoples. 
uh, Lumumba had been killed. Before that, you have uh, Felix Ola Mumie in Cameroon. In Cameroon, there was a terrible repression, and in many other countries. So you could see that um, the most valuable African leaders somehow have been killed or have been repressed in a way that they could not fulfill their vision. You could cut many, many examples. You had Modi Keita, uh, you had Silvanis Olympio, uh, you had uh, Kwame Koma, uh, you had also Thomas Sankar. There are many, many examples. So until now, it has been very difficult to have progressive people leading African countries, uh, let's say, for a long spell of time in order to um, implement progressive policies. It has been very difficult. And this is also uh, an expression of uh, the way imperialism works. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question from my side before I hand over to uh, Julia would be one aspect of the colonial continuity is also the, the role of uh, multi uh, national companies operating across the continent. In this we spoke about uh, Bolloré, just as one of the examples. Mm -hmm. A French company establishing more than 40 um, African uh, countries. Um, but I would maybe ask you to comment on uh, uh, another example from, from Senegal. Last year, we saw the president of Senegal um, inaugurating a new railway line between the, the airport of Dakar and uh, between the city of Dakar and the, and the new airport. And uh, that day, everybody saw the train, and it was also the last time we have seen it. <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good example. Uh, the train has been the, integrated because it was before the elections. And yeah, it was a way of saying for the incumbent president of saying, I have done many things for you. And this is uh, yeah, a new train which will um, link the airport to, to, to Dakar, the main city. But in fact, we have never seen this train yet. And it is not a surprise. Uh, and uh, when the decision was made to build that train, that rail, rail when uh, many people in Senegal, including the newspaper, they say that this is a way of saving the French company Alstom, uh, because Alstom was in a bad economic and financial shape, and through having access to this uh, contract of uh, building. Uh, of, of providing trains to Senegal, it has somehow uh, helped uh, at least Alstom. And we have not seen that train yet. And you see that the, the enormous amount uh, allocated to this project, according to some experts, could have uh, been enough, let's say, to um, rehabilitate all the rail, railway system in Senegal, which has been destroyed by the structural adjustment plans. So you see that um, when you are not independent politically, when you ask for help or ask for loans, that help or those loans are somehow directed to particular investments. And that is what is happening. And uh, especially the French government is generally tying its uh, aid and its also uh, loan policies with specific uh, project implemented by French enterprises. We know, for example, that uh, uh, when uh, multilateral debt and bilateral debt uh, were cancelled uh, in the mid of the 2000s, all the major countries, high income countries, cancelled effectively their debts uh, owed by Africa. But this was not the case of France. Why? Uh, because they decided to convert those debts into instruments for their for their companies for example if senegal had a debt a debt of for example uh, 1 billion euro senegal would still pay the debt but the payment of that debt would be allocated to specific infrastructure projects which would be uh, implemented by french companies so you see that uh, the issue of 
political sovereignty, economic sovereignty, monetary sovereignty, all those are, are linked. Thank you very much, Dr. Ndongo. Now I will hand over to Julia. Julia. Hey, good evening. Thank you very much for this brilliant um, discourse presentation. The chat is really, there's a vivid communication and debate emerging. I will try um, to bundle the question a bit. Um, so the first question, um, concerns that colonialism is still nurtured by ruling classes. That also refers a bit to you, what you call cooperation agreements and the repression. So um, economic problems need policy solutions, probably through a strong pan-Africanist social movements. Would you agree or what would um, be your proposal for political solutions? And um, how could or should the accessibility of financial resources be facilitated to the majority of African people? That would be the first bundle. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that we have to change our way of uh, seeing uh, economic policy in, uh, in Africa because there is um, uh, often this idea that uh, Africa uh, lacks savings or Africa lacks financial resources. But when you know how the monetary system works, uh, you know that uh, provided that you have real resources, provided that you have land, you have labor, you have some technical expertise, you have raw materials, you can finance in your own currency, which is technically possible. And I think that has been that that should be the way to go. That means a um, kind of economic model based on the resources we have. Uh, if you have the resources, you have the financing. If you design a good monetary banking financial system, and this should not be complicated. But uh, generally, um, the um, Africa's partners tend to reason differently. And even African countries generally tend to reason differently. They will always say that they are lacking resources. They are lacking financial resources. But they have those resources. And when they say they are lacking savings, no. Generally, their savings are exported. So they should stop the exportation of the savings. They export their savings, so paying external debts, so profit repatriations, etc. So I think that um, uh, what we call uh, reclaiming economic and monetary sovereignty should be the basis for uh, envisioning um, other um, other kind of uh, economic policies. And uh, this is a technical proposition, but I am aware that uh, if we want to uh, have some, let's say, make some progress uh, on those technical solutions, we have also to make some democratic progress. Uh, because the issue is not only Africa against, let's say, the imperialist uh, in the rest of the world, but it is also African ordinary people against their own leaders, their own leaders, which are often much more receptive to the demands and needs of, let's say, the global system rather than the demands and the needs of their own population. That means that uh, democracy is needed. But when we say democracy, is not just uh, elections every four or five years. That means having political systems where economic policy uh, is reflecting the needs of the majority and where those needs are in conflict with the demands of the world system, the demands of the World Bank, the IMF, France, uh, Germany, United States, etc. That those demands uh, would not be prioritary compared to what is uh, demanded by ordinary African people. Thank you very much. The next one, Julia. Yeah. Um, the next one goes a bit further into um, African economy and um, within the, its reception within the population. So how would you convince rich Africans to invest in Africa and not transfer their wealth abroad? And how do you perceive corruption? So which, which uh, corruption that probably makes uh, young Africans not too keen to create enterprises? 
And I would like to add um, a known question to these corruption based questions, because um, seen from here from Germany, um, the aid uh, industry says we are giving aid to Africa, but there's only corrupt regimes. And I see that the, the European Union, the trade partners are not doing do not have measures or do not want to um, to take measures to prevent that corruption. So maybe they do foster, foster it. And how do you per perceive that? So this would be like three questions regarding the corruption issue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how to convince rich Africans to invest in Africa? Uh, the issue is, do we have to convince them? In fact, we have to make sure that uh, the states have a control on financial flows going abroad. That is important. And uh, for development policies, it might be good to have rich Africans uh, on our side to invest domestically, etc. But at the same time, uh, when you are a sovereign currency issuer, you have the possibility of financing everything that is technically possible uh, in your own economy. So that is something we have to um, we have to acknowledge uh, because generally there is there is this narrative about lack of savings or lack of taxes from the um, from the from African governments. But we have to make clear that when you have your own currency, you are a monopoly issuer of your own currency. Uh, you can devise your financial monetary system in such a way that every project which is uh, good for the prosperity of the majority, which is good for the well-being of the majority, uh, could be financed, provided that the real resources exist in the economy. Real resources are land, uh, equipment, uh, technical expertise, manpower, etc. So we have to have this lens to say that we have first to focus on what do we have, what are the kind of real resources we have, from how real resources, what can we do? And from there, we could think of, let's go to borrow money from from the rich, richest countries. Let's go to ask uh, the rich Africans whether they want to invest domestically or not. I think we have to, to change the way of uh, seeing, uh, let's say, the economic policy. We have first to focus on the kind of real resources we have, and from there, how can we unleash uh, our uh, power of issuing our own national currencies? I see for myself this as a basic uh, starting point. So yes, the, the rich could be helpful in financing some projects, but uh, the role of the state is to make sure that uh, some flows stay, some financial resources stay in the country, and at the same time, the state has to uh, use all his monetary powers to make sure that uh, everything that could be uh, uh, technically done in the country uh, is financed using uh, local currency. Uh, the corruption issue is a very uh, complicated one. And uh, for myself, I am very, um, uh, let's say, critical of the ideas that uh, corruption is a factor explaining Africa's uh, uh, under development and so on. For sure, uh, corruption is not a good thing. And for sure, a corruption has uh, economic consequences. But if we talk just uh, using economic, let's say, an economic point of view, uh, corruption is harmful uh, to Africa's development because often it is associated with external financial flows. But if the money of corruption stayed in Africa and was used to finance, let's say, productive projects, uh, we, we could not say that corruption is harmful to Africa. We could not say that. The, the only impact we know for sure is that whenever corruption is associated with external financial flows, yes, this is harmful for Africa. This is harmful for democracy. This is harmful for equality, etc. But we could not say in the abstract that, yeah, corruption is the main factor responsible for Africa's underdevelopment. The second thing that when you have um, uh, corruption, every time they have two parts, uh, the one who corrupts and the one who is corrupted. If you look, for example, at the ranking done by Transparency International, every time you have the 
uh, some African countries at the bottom of the ranking, saying that Africans are the most corrupt uh, in, in the world. But uh, what those rankings do not say is that, in fact, African populations are the victims of the system of corruption. And the system of corruption has an Africa part and have an external part. Uh, uh, external part. And um, you see that in this uh, ranking by Transparency International, the countries which are ordinarily ranked as the most clean, who, has, who are the most performing on corruptions, you see that half of the, let's say, 21st best countries in terms of uh, fighting uh, against corruption, they are actually tax havens, you see, more or less tax havens. So you have a ranking saying that these are clean countries, and on the other hand, we know that most of them are tax havens. So I think this rhetoric about corruption is not uh, very uh, c c convincing. Uh, we have many forms of corruption. And for myself, I tend to um, uh, have a um, view of corruption based on, uh, let's say, uh, all the political theory. Because in the, for example, uh, Greek political theory, uh, they, they had this idea of corruption. When a government is no longer uh, fulfilling uh, its basic task, is no longer pursuing uh, the well-being, this government is corrupt. But you see in the capitalist system, uh, for me, it's a corrupt system because capitalists say that what is important is the profit for the investor and uh, everything else does not matter. What matters first is the profit of the investor. And so you could people uh, into um, unemployment. Uh, you can uh, exploit people, you can destroy rivers, you could do whatever you want, only profit reigns supreme. So for me, uh, we have to see corruption as a global system. Capitalist system is a corrupt system in so far as it places uh, profits uh, uh, first uh, before, let's say, well-being, before dignity, before anything else. So I would uh, rather see the corruption as a much larger topic than what is currently being said about uh, Africa. And we also know from some recent studies that most of the money given by, let's say, Western donors uh, somehow uh, will go back uh, to tax havens in um, uh, yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global north. So, yeah, this is a complicated issue, and I think uh, it does not uh, explain uh, any, anything, this issue of corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was mind-blowing, and I hope that I will have more clever, um, I will have more clever answers to uh, persons um, asking me these questions next time. Thanks. Um, I don't know if we will be able to, because there is many um, questions waiting, and I will try to bundle them another time. But yeah, um, for the basic point you made um, that the decommodification of basic goods would be a primary step uh, into a better system. Um, how do you imagine this decommodification? And um, what do you mean with job guarantee or how would you pursue job guarantee? Yeah, uh, I, I start by the second question. The job guarantee is a policy proposal by uh, some number of uh, economists from what is called the modern monetary theory, MMT. And MMT um, uh, sees uh, job guarantee as a fundamental policy tool uh, allowing uh, governments to achieve full employment. Because uh, in modern monetary economies, in capitalist economies, uh, the private sector could not guarantee full employment. Uh, even the best performing capitalist economies will always uh, have uh, some level of unemployment. The only way to eradicate unemployment would be to have a job guarantee, meaning that the government will stand ready to uh, propose a job uh, paid at uh, minimum wage uh, to every uh, uh, demander of a job, every people willing to, to work for the, for the minimum wage and yeah, the state could provide that. And uh, why uh, this proposal was made? Because uh, when you are a monopoly issuer of your currency, you could always afford 
to uh, buy what is uh, for sale in your own currency. That means that uh, when you issue your own currency, uh, you could uh, uh, create uh, enough of your currency in order to hire people to do work, uh, works that would be beneficial to the economy. So when you have your own currency, the technical limitations you have uh, is that if do you have resources, the real resources, but you do not have uh, genuinely uh, financial resources. You could not say, I can't afford this or that financially. Uh, the question of being able to afford or not is secondary. The first thing to see is that, do you have uh, real resources to do this or that project? If you have resources, you could uh, create the money through your own banking monetary system. And the job guarantee fits in that perspective. It's a way of saying that uh, we have to do our best uh, so that every people can have access to a job. And I think in the developing countries and uh, in Africa particularly, we need such kind of initiatives because we have seen that the economic growth, even in the Africa rising period, starting from the 2000, there has not been a net creation of office and jobs. Mostly more than 95% of all jobs created have been in the informal sector. If I take the case of my country, Senegal, we had uh, since uh, 2012 uh, 6% average of uh, real GDP growth. But uh, during this period, there has been no net creation of jobs in the modern sector. That means basically all the jobs have been created by the informal sector. And so that means that uh, provided that we put in place the right, let's say, banking and monetary system and have the right uh, macroeconomic tools, it is possible for our states to put in place, put in place uh, initiatives such as the, 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 the job guarantee. Uh, about decommodifying basic goods, for me, it's something which is um, uh, straightforward. Uh, Sorry. May I, just because in the chat there were um, two people um, reacting um, to what you just said about job guarantee. And um, at first a person uh, asked, uh, but what to do if tax authorities demand 200% of revenue to a young uh, entrepreneur? And if not paying, they would just close down his business. And then another person reacted and said, and um, do you think that an unconditional basic un income could be an alternative to this idea of job guarantees? Sorry to interrupt you with that. No, okay, no, you're welcome. Oh, in fact, uh, the World Bank is pushing for a kind of job guarantee, uh, a kind of basic income. Uh, for example, uh, what is called uh, uh, Bolso Familia in uh, Latin, in Brazil, for example, in French, say Bolso Secreté Familial, uh, it's a way of uh, providing some sort of uh, income support to the most vulnerable. But for me, this is not an, um, an efficient uh, way. For me, it's just a way of uh, subsidizing poverty. Uh, because uh, the amounts given to those people, I, I talk about the African context and the Senegal is one, the amounts are very um, so, so small. If you take, for example, in, in, in Senegal, they are given 25,000 CFA franc uh, 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 every quarter. That means that they have 150 euros per year. It's nothing. It's nothing for, for, for family. I would prefer a job guarantee. Because with a basic income, you do not necessarily increase your domestic capabilities. And the idea behind a job guarantee is to say that those selected to occupy a, a job, federal job guaranteed by the state, uh, this kind of uh, job will help improve domestic capabilities. In Africa, we have to Im improve domestic cap capabilities. If you just give money, it's a way of, um, let's say, subsidizing consumption and indirectly poverty because amount are not uh, um, are not sufficient are not enough uh, i am not against the idea uh, of basic income but uh, i think that uh, for now at the current level of development african countries uh, people aspire much more to having jobs than receiving low uh, low um, income support and uh, about the taxes uh, if you are reasoning with the modern monetary 
theory framework, the MMT framework, you know that uh, taxes uh, are not funding, let's say, uh, government spending, because before people could pay their taxes in the currency unit defined by the government, the government has to spend first. So that means that the logical um, the logical situation is that the government spend first and people could afterwards pay their taxes. So taxes are not a limitation uh, in terms of spending. Uh, obviously, it is better that the uh, African governments could uh, increase their taxations, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, taxation coverage. It's, it's important because this will give much more fiscal leeway for, for, for African governments. But if we are reasoning with uh, the framework of monetary sovereignty, uh, we have to make it clear that uh, taxes are not what is funding government spending. Taxes could fund government spending for government which do not have monetary sovereignty. For example, in my country, we don't have our own currency. So we need taxes to fund, to fund the economic project, to fund uh, uh, government spending. But still, the idea has to be that uh, African government have to do their best so that they achieve much more monetary sovereignty. Because achieving much more monetary sovereignty, that means that African governments will have less and less financial constraints. They will have mostly technical constraints. Could they do this or that? Because the issue of how to finance it could be somehow uh, attenuated by designing the adequate monetary and banking framework. Julia, do you still have questions and comments from the chat? Yes, um, we, we could redraw um, maybe also to the um, decommodification point. Um, and there was a question uh, regarding a pan continental, pan African, pan continental free trade zone, uh, assuming the African continental free trade area uh, is only an internal trade deal. Why is a trade block not strengthening African positions in the globalist world? And yeah, well, I might stick with that. Um, Dr. Ndonga, before you answer to that question, thank you, Julia, for that. I would like to also comment on, on that. In your presentation, you say that uh, the continental free trade area is a kind of um, triumph of Afro-liberalism. Uh, you know that uh, saying that you are making many people nervous across the continent mm -hmm. because uh, many people see the achievement or the commencement of the, the continental free trade area as uh, a dream come true. It's the realization of the idea of, um, of uh, pan-Africanism. Where do you see uh, pitfalls uh, internally and uh, externally when it comes to this continental free trade area? And uh, what would the alternative looks like? Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, I start by the decommodification issue. Uh, for me, it's important that basic goods and services necessary for identified life be decommodified. Why? Because uh, the idea of economic catch-up, we have to forget it. Uh, most most uh, citizens of the global south will never be able to have a life, Western lifestyle. This is not possible because uh, there are ecological constraints to that kind of achievement. But saying that does not mean that uh, citizens of the global south will be condemned to poverty or inequality. That means that uh, we have no other option than to have an equatorial economic and political model. And this equatorial political economic model means that everything that is necessary for dignified life, for example, having uh, access to, uh, for, for, for kids to, to school, having access to safe water, having uh, access to a decent shelter, etc., transportation, uh, safe uh, uh, food, etc. This uh, should be something every government should come to uh, every of its citizens. And when I say decommodification, that means that those who can't afford it, that should not be complicated for them. 
and those who have not have um, enough incomes that should be guaranteed for me i don't say that this can be done uh, in the short run but this has to be for me the, the perspective we have to forget the catch up uh, let's say narrative the catch up view but try to say that we as a decent uh, civilized society we have to make sure that everything that is necessary could be um, accessible to everybody for me for me it's a guiding line for economic policy regarding the african continental free trade area i am aware that i have a, a minority view but i think that my minority view is somehow grounded in original pan-africanism because if you read for example koma koma was saying that we have to unite but how should we unite uh, for pan-africanism originally uh, unity has first to be political not economic political that means at least we have to have uh, some consensus uh, between African countries on some issues. For example, a concerted foreign policy, a concerted policy to sell our raw materials, and also a ways of facilitating, uh, let's say, exchanges, for example, uh, through uh, having, let's say, a common currency. I don't say it's single currency, but common currency, or let's say, swap lines etc uh, that was a coma coma's view saying that if we are united uh, we will be uh, uh, in a position to leverage our unity we'll be able to sell our commodities and have good prices for them and industrialize the continent and when we say industrialize the continent it's not senegal industrializing individually next to cote d'ivoire or to guinea bissau it is a continent industrializing and with a continental plan because that was the original Pan-Africanist view. And we know that um, in the process of economic integration, there will be losers, but losers will be compensated because there is a democratic political framework. This was the original Pan-Africanist view. But the ISCFTA and the other so-called Pan-Africanist uh, schemes currently, they are totally different. That's why I call that Afro-liberalism. They are saying that you have to put African peoples in competition, and at the end, you will have unity. Uh, because the African continental free trade area is only based on the logic of comparative advantage. And comparative advantage means that countries have to specialize. There is a country which will specialize on raw materials and as we industrialize. And um, a, a comparative advantage is a colonial doctrine. There is a good uh, book by an author named um it's a norwegian offer uh called why the rich nation get rich and why poor nation stay stay poor i i, I currently forget his his name but uh, you look at his book he's saying that uh, those who industrialize those who develop are those countries which refused the logic of comparative advantage that means specializing uh, according to what you have you know and the uh, continental free trade area is following this type of colonial logic. I would ask a question. Why would we try to put into competition, let's say, the uh, Malian policy of cotton with the position of cotton from Burkina Faso? Who would win from that? Why we need such competition? Could we not try uh, to coordinate things so that we will give good prices for uh, all the cotton producers what, or whatever the countries where they are, they are they are living in. For me, there are other kind of economic uh, integrations that are possible, but which are not accepted by the Afro-liberal project. For example, we could try to have regional projects where uh, all African countries, let's say in West Africa, will do our best to have monetary or uh, to have um, uh, food sovereignty and also energy sovereignty. You take the case of West Africa, uh, at least uh, from 20 to 65 percent of all our imports are imports of food products and energy products. And we have all what is needed to have our self-sufficiency in terms of uh, food production and also energy production. But we are not doing that. We are saying we want competition between us and so that we will develop. But we know that there is no country which developed through free trade. So I can understand the rationale for African continental free trade area. And at the same time, the obstacles to African trade are not, uh, let's say, tariff and non-tariff barriers. 
the obstacles are due to the fact that how local domestic productions are not diversified. So in some way, we could not exchange between us because our production is not diversified. So you have to tackle, let's say, the, uh, the domestic uh, structures. You have to transform them in order for Africans to, to create more between themselves. And I would add that uh, at the current uh, period where we are talking about ecological limits, about the uh, threat of climate changes, etc., trade for the sake of trade, uh, for me, it's not something interesting. We have to trade because this is something, this corresponds to objective needs, but not trade for the sake of creating profits for some actors or somehow. Uh, so I, I am not really convinced by the project of African continental free trade area. And when you look at the uh, so-called uh, scientific work uh, done on it, you would be amazed by the lack of, um, let's say, uh, scientific rigor. Uh, all those studies uh, about African continental free trade area, they are based on the assumption that uh, Africa is on full employment. Yes, I say that. They are on full employment. Uh, all the exchange rates are flexible. And when uh, governments lose uh, their tax uh, uh, income, their tariff income, they will have no consequences for let's say they are macroeconomic uh, management and also they are when they are um, trade uh, deteriorate their terrible deteriorate it will come to to equilibrium quickly so that there is no debt issue nothing these are the type of assumptions uh, which have been the basis of let's say all the numbers uh, which are which have been put forward to say that the IFCFTA will bring this order. I'm not convinced by the academic uh, scientific work done about the IFCFTA, and uh, I'm not also convinced by this project. Africa does not need uh, free trade. Africa needs cooperation to achieve food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, more monetary integration, more monetary sovereignty and also less dependence on, let's say, uh, foreign sources of uh, finance. Thank you very much. Julia, I would hand over to you for a very short uh, <laughs> comment, and then we'll come back here to try to conclude the session. Um, yeah, I'm a bit eager to ask one more question out of the chat. Um, it's concerning land grabbing. Um, it hits also the point of commodification and demodification because um, people are asking so who is profiting of land grabbing right now, leasing the land to um, foreign um, companies, and how could uh, we achieve food sovereignty um, facing this land grabbing issue? That was, this would be the last question out of the chat. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ndongo? I, 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 I did not hear you very well. I think there was a slight connection issue. OK. Uh, Julia? Could, yeah. you please, could you please repeat the question? Um, OK. Short, issue. Sorry. Um, OK. Um, take a short. Um, how do you see the land grabbing issue right now? Uh, who profits from it, and um, how could food how sovereignty? How, how could it be stopped? How could food sovereignty be achieved? Uh, although land grabbing is is going on. So, Dr. Ndongo, I will connect uh, that question to um, the last one also from my side. Um, you spoke about uh, delinking, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very interesting um, model. I liked it actually. It's uh, something also um, I I try to to reflect in in my work. Um, and you spoke about the initiatives by the African intellectuals, and I assume it's not a an event, just uh, signing a letter. It's, um, it's a process. And how can this process um, maybe contribute to, uh, to sustain um, forces across the continent? We are trying to work on this project of delinking uh, Africa and uh, trying to relink the continent on uh, another base. 
And maybe another aspect also connected to, to that one, you spoke about remittances of the diaspora. Uh, can maybe remittances be a, at least a possibility for the country, countries of the continent to achieve other models of development because remittances are not connected to imperialistic projects? Those will be the last questions. You can connect them with uh, your last remarks, and then um, I will take over again to conclude our session. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much. I think uh, the question Julia and you raised are, are linked. Uh, land grabbing, uh, achieving food sovereignty, are uh, connected with the issue of delinking. Delinking uh, is a concept uh, which has been proposed by, by, by Samir Ami. He wrote a book about delinking. And one of the first, let's say, aspect of delinking is for any government to have um, the control on the prices uh, obtained uh, for the labor of, let's say, agricultural uh, producers. It's important. And uh, if you subscribe to, uh, for example, free trade policies, like the economic partnership agreements the European Union want African countries to sign. If you are uh, following the African continental free trade area, that means that you are not in a perspective of delinking because you don't want food sovereignty. Uh, you don't want to have good prices for the labor of your uh, agricultural producers. Uh, that means you are just in a way of uh, integrating the world system in an African so-called way. Uh, so delinking uh, means that uh, the government will try to do its best uh, so that agricultural producers will be um, protected. They'll have access to land in a democratic way, and the government will provide the necessary technical income support uh, so that they will be able to achieve food sovereignty. Uh, yesterday, I heard an example. I, I heard a story. I'm not sure it is true. I have to wait that is published, but it was shocking. Why? Because in the south of Senegal, uh, there was uh, land which had been given to uh, an investor, a investor, uh, so that it could export things to to abroad. But what happens is that uh, people have been evicted from their lands, and uh, some of them, and especially the women, have been recruited to work on those lands. But you see that those women were receiving uh, one euro every three days. That was their remuneration that is sapphire exploitation. But the worst part of this is that those women have never been paid until now. One euro every three days, and they have not been paid. Uh, I, I heard this story uh, through someone who is based in that region and who w spoke to, to, to those women. So when you have such kind of things, and you have a state saying that I have 6% GDP growth, etc. This is not at all delinking. When you say that uh, you stick with such kind of practices, you want free trade uh, between African countries, you will only exacerbate uh, those uh, tendencies. So that's why I think the role of intellectuals, uh, critical intellectuals, should be to um, uh, put the finger on those kind of practices, but also to say that we have alternatives. Uh, everything, uh, every project, let's say, uh, um, supported by African uh, leaders uh, are not always good. But we could try to do our best to uh, try to think uh, differently. You are talking about uh, remittances. Remittances are a uh, uh, source of foreign uh, currency, important source. Uh, in many countries, like, for example, Senegal, the migrant remittances are higher than foreign debt investment and uh, uh, official development assistance combined. So it's really important. But at the same time, we have to distinguish uh, how our financial needs in domestic currency and how our financial needs in foreign currency, because we need foreign currency to buy necessary imports, uh, to pay external debt, etc. But for everything that is technically feasible uh, locally, we do not need, let's say, uh, foreign currency or whatever uh, its, uh, its its origin. So I think we have to change our way of uh, thinking 
about um, economic policy by uh, having the lens of monetary sovereignty, saying that we have to do our best to rely on our uh, real resources and uh, by giving priority to domestic um, financing. I think that uh, the man who articulated best this point of view was the late uh, Burkina Bay leader, Thomas Sankara. Thomas Sankara, in his speech at the Organization of the African Union in 1987, uh, not only criticized external debt uh, owed uh, by Africa, but he was saying that the best way of uh, moving forward is to live like, like Africans. And what he called living like Africans is to live with uh, the resources we have around us. If we start from the resources we have around us, uh, the prospect of uh, sustained uh, prosperity for the majority uh, will be possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Ndongo, for being with us. Thank you very much for your uh, answers, your explanations. We will conclude this session now. I would like to thank everybody who has been uh, here. Uh, some I have left now, but uh, um, some people are still there. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you to all the colleagues in Frankfurt who have worked very hard to make this session possible. Thank you to Julia for the co-moderation and Andrea for the technical support. Uh, I would like to announce two dates. Uh, the first one is the 10th of November. I think it's uh, Monday, if I don't mistake. Um, Dr. Ndongo would be uh, on a panel organized by the uh, left MP, Eva Maria Schreiber, uh, discussing about the uh, continental free trade area. If you are interested in the topic, please uh, join. Uh, another Tuesday. another date, please? Tuesday. Ah, it's Tuesday, yes. The 10th of uh, November is Tuesday. Another very important date, it's uh, the 30th of November, the last day of the month to be the conclusion of the Rethinking Africa for this year. And we'll be discussing about the necessity to decolonize the mind in order to achieve development across the continent. And we'll have very great uh, speakers like uh, today. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. And I hope the news coming from the US won't be very depressive. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have Thank a you. nice evening. Bye-bye.